How's it going everyone? Um, I'm absolutely astonished to have seen a really, really cool video come out on Rick Beato's uh, YouTube. He had this insanely cool chat with Misha Mansour, Tosa Nabassi, and Tim Henson. So Misha's from Periphery and a solo artist, as you might know. Tosa Nabassi of Animals as Leaders is an absolute guitar legend, and Tim Henson is an incredible guitarist from the band Polyphia. So Rick Beato, if you don't know, is an incredible musician. He has this amazing wealth of material on his YouTube where he deconstructs songs like the craziest pop song he's ever played and loads of other amazing videos. He got together in a room with Misha, Tosin and Tim and recorded a video and they talked about, you know, modern guitar and things in the modern guitar world. And at around about 36 minutes in, I believe, and the conversation went towards how YouTube has kind of helped raise the bar for people in every walk of life, not just music, but also talking about the effect on sports and how seeing that other people are now breaking world records kind of makes people able to break records even further. Um, so they talked about it with sports, they talked about it with music, of course. And then when they were talking about it with drums, they referenced Alex Rudinger and myself. They talked about the misunderstanding of how drummers hear the consistency of sampled drums without knowing that there's sampled drums involved. That drummers like myself would hear that music that, you know, Misha was putting out back in the early days. And, uh, you know, with his bulb demos and stuff like that. And then basically to, for me, I would hear those songs and I was sure that that was just an amazing drummer who was playing and just smashing it. Turns out, of course, quite a few years later, I find out, no, it's not at all a real drummer. It's a program, it's sampled drums. At the time, I think the best thing that they had available to them was two tracks, uh, Superior Drummer or Drum Kit From Hell uh, as an expansion to that. And the fact that Misha recognized this and talked about it at this kind of round table interview was just so awesome. And it made me really want to make a video just kind of reacting to that, not directly watching it back, but just kind of responding as how much that means to me. Uh, it was incredibly touching to hear, mainly because I've, you know, I've strived to get this kind of consistency out of me, even after I found out that it wasn't a human playing the stuff that was inspiring the journey that I went on to get higher consistency and to get that sound out of a real drum kit. Um, and also just because of the amount of, you know, blood, sweat and tears that's gone into that process. And I realized, yeah, I might have talked about, you know, my injury history, but maybe I didn't actually touch enough on why I got injured and the general, like, obviously, you know, drummers hitting hard is kind of like, a thing, everyone kind of knows it's a thing, but I realized that the mentality of why it's a thing is something I talk about a lot with my students in my private lessons, but I don't think I've actually made any content about it on this channel. So this is a perfect opportunity to just talk about it a little and um, and refer to it because of how, of how awesome it is that it was recognized by these incredible musicians. And referencing to this injury video that I made that you can check out here, um, it's really painful in a lot of ways because trying to get this level of drumming out of me ended up hurting me in a lot of ways. And yes, I talked about the specific injury that I had, the specifics of it, but not the mentality behind why is this drummer trying to hit hard? Of course, I can never blame the musicians making these awesome sounding songs with these incredibly inhuman sounding drummers. Uh, for any of my own issues, you know, at the end of the day, me trying to get to this point also tied into my own like low self-worth and that led into me feeling like I had to push through imposter syndrome and basically, you know, make myself better because if people saw the normal me, they would know that I was a fraud. So I had to overachieve in order to get there. And obviously the thing that finally stopped me and got me out of the cycle of injury was therapy and coming to terms with, you know, the concept of self-worth and self-harm 
and actually identifying my musical process as a form of self-harm was a huge shock at the time, but it's something I'm really glad to have moved past now. But yeah, yes, I've talked about the injury. Yes, I've talked about, you know, the keyboard drum stuff, you know, how I can make, you know, an instrument like this or, you know, an interface like this actually make me able to play drums now on the on the go, like in this portable setup that I'm in at my mother and father-in-law's home in uh, Poznan, which is where I'm recording from now. Um, why I actually had to put in that much time and effort into creating that. So if you haven't seen that video, please do go check it out. It's a good insight into the journey I've been on. But yeah, going back to Misha and those early days of those bulb songs that I would hear on SoundClick and on MySpace, man, when I heard those songs, when I heard that sound and I was like, yo, these drummers, whoever this drummer is at the time, I just thought it was like a combination of uh, Travis Orbin's drumming and Taylor Larson's engineering, I was like, I, I gotta get there. I don't know how, but I'm gonna get there. And it made me go back to the drawing board and look at you know, how am I striking the kick drum? How even are my strokes? If I go for flurries, if I go for quick triplets, if I switch my leading foot. Of course, back then I wasn't consciously aware of these mechanics and the way that I am now. And, uh, but you know, that, that kind of awareness comes from, you know, long-term processing of this kind of stuff. But yeah, working through that process of, you know, looking at that, those mechanics, that was an incredible journey when I look back on it, because not for the fact that uh, it was unique or that no one else was doing it, but just that when I put my mind to achieving that, it actually did work out over the years. And the craziest part was that it gave me this edge over other drummers that my lack of knowledge earlier on in my career about what a sampled program drum kit sounds like could give me an edge in the future is kind of crazy. And it really resonated with me that Misha himself would reference me as an example of technology inspiring humanity, like life imitating art imitating life, or the other way around, I can't remember. But um, the fact it was him to mention that was uh, just extraordinary because he's the, not just him, but I mean, at the time also Tosin um, were, you know, and the work that they were doing with both, you know, early animals as leaders and, and periphery, this sound that was coming out was just like, what, how? And the fact it was them who mentioned this now as an example, they also reference Alex Rudinger, who was another inspiration of mine. Um, and here's the craziest part that I don't think I even ever really told Rudy. So if you're watching this, Alex, <laughs> uh, this is really cool um, to get this kind of conversation going because I, I couldn't believe it was possible that people could play with that level of dynamic consistency while being so technical, jumping between subdivisions. But then I saw Alex Rudinger in his early YouTube days, and I genuinely thought that that was, that, you know, that he was, you know, these, these are the players, you know, rooting a, a Orbin at the time when I was really, when I was younger, like what, 15, 16, and really, really like eating the stuff up, maybe even 14, I can't quite remember. Um, and now thinking that perhaps that Rudy was also hearing this stuff and not knowing that it was programmed and then having the same journey. I'm not sure. I'm not, obviously I'd love to have a chat with him and, and discover like, where did that consistency stuff come from? But I also wanted to shout out some other incredible drummers who I think have made this kind of a journey as well. And I'd love to invite them to continue this discussion. Perhaps we can have some live chats on my Twitch, on podcasts, maybe make some videos out of it on YouTube. Just, I think this is a really, really interesting conversation to have because it's been genre defining and, and it's elevated the instrument to a whole new level. What Misha and Tosin and, and all these other guitarists have done with programming to then make drummers then have to basically feel like they have to get to that level and then in order to sound like that live and and in the studio um, I'd also be really interested to chat to you know recording technicians and engineers and producers about specifically what they did and what they do to make you know a drummers who are that consistent and b drummers who are more normal human consistency with a bit more fluctuation. What they do to actually fix that, how much they 
um, you know, focus on dynamic correction from the source audio, like compression um, and leveling, uh, or and how much, where, where's the point where they turn to triggering and drum replacement. And also just to, just to, in general, I love to open up the veil on this because like in the modeling industry, there's so much artificial um, stuff going on that I think it would be really good for us to talk about really what's going on because, you know, I, so many of my drum videos are edited to heck. Um, if they're not edited, they are comped to heck. There's loads and loads of different takes. Um, and I'd love to do some breakdowns, you know, more in depth behind the scenes stuff of like what goes into breaking down a drum part, um, you know, what do the actual individual takes of a session sound like? Because obviously I just comp them, you know, I'll take the good bit from that one, jump to the good bit of the next one, the next section will start and then we'll move on and then it's not like what an athlete would do where they just, they just do it and whatever they did is it. Uh, which that's a mindset I'm getting into just letting what will be will be like in portals I had to do I had to just record whatever would happen and then whatever shot the camera was hitting at that time Whatever take that was in that's just it. I'm not gonna get to tell Richard Oaks the editor of portals And I actually tried to and then realized how wrong I was to try hey, okay Here's 30 changes. I need you to make because in these I, there are better things going on in a different take and he's like, dude, I can't do that. Like, and I realized how crazy it was of me to be making, you know, making the things that weren't the best. Just don't let anyone see that. That was crazy. And I'm really coming around to that now. And for those of you who don't know, Portals is a Tesseract show that I was part of recently that's just come out and is available on Blu-ray. It's an incredible audio visual experience that Tesseract did that Jay Postones, their drummer, wasn't able to fly out for. So they entrusted me with depping for that show. Please do check it out. There's some videos on YouTube that are linked here um, that are references to that show. And if you like it, please do support the band and buy a copy because that was an incredible feat to do, especially over lockdown in 2020 because of COVID. Referring back to some of these other drummers who've made this journey, um, obviously there was Alex Rudinger, but I think I need to make some shout outs as well to other drummers that I've seen have made this journey and have nailed this, um, this ability within themselves as well. Like Anoop Sastri, who is an incredible drummer. If you haven't heard of him, please, I'll link some videos of his here. He's an absolutely insanely good drummer who I was also really influenced by over the internet, trying to get to that level, you know, that, that kind of challenge myself to try and sound as good as he was sounding. Um, just over the internet without having met, just having that much like like inspiration and aspiration towards. Um, and he plays for Sky Harbor and he's played for so many other bands. And the first time I saw him live, um, we I actually toured with him when he was playing and filling in for Jeff Loomis um, on a tour that we did with Monuments that was around Eurobast Volume 7. And we did like a tour that was Vildjata, Jeff Loomis, Monuments, and I believe the other band in that tour was Stealing Axiom at the time. But yeah, Anoop watching him night after night, man, that guy can play. That guy's consistency was insane. And he plays with these like tree trunk sticks. Like, I'm not sure if he still does. I'd love him to correct me on this if he still does. But the, the sticks he was using back then were so thick. They were like marching course sticks to get that incredible backbeat. And I just... You know, at the time I saw that as such a term of endearment hitting the snare that hard that it just fills the room. It's so exciting and I hadn't seen many other players. In fact, I don't think I'd seen any other drummers who laid into that backbeat so hard live. And then when I discovered what kind of sticks he was using to do that, one of the ways I discovered what kind of energy was going on was that he broke a snare drum at a show. Can't remember what show it was on that Euroblast tour. And I just jumped and grabbed my snare and gave it to him for like the last song or two or whatever. And it had a pretty fresh head on it. And then when he finished playing, the the skin was dented. I'm not talking just like a little pit. I'm talking about like a full on crater in the inside, on the center of the uh, skin. And the, the skin was, a, I thought, a pretty high tension. So the fact he's striking it that hard to actually properly like, make the snare lose all of its cohesion in the center, the plastics to just completely bend out of place that when you loosened it, 
that crater stayed there. It didn't matter if it was tight or loose. It was like the, the plastic, the ply was stretched. And okay, yeah, at the time I was like, this is the best thing. This is the best thing any drummer could ever do. But now I look at it and if I was seeing him now, I would be like, dude, your wrists, man, like, please be careful. Please don't hurt yourself. Like, it's not worth it. Nothing is worth, man, nothing is worth that. You know, cause, um, yeah, cause holy shit, like, like that's so much power. And uh, yeah, as I say, I'm just really, really inspired. He was really inspiring to me. He still is now. I, you know, I hope that that power never puts him at the risk of injury like it did for me. It may well be that I was just particularly bad with self-loathing and needing to push past what I thought was like the, you know, the, the level where people would see through to the fraud that I was. Anyway, yeah, you, you get it. But some other incredible drummers uh, that I've seen since, that I've learned of since, who I know who have gone through this journey, because I can just tell because of analyzing how they play both live and in the studio and just, just hearing what's going on at the source, watching endless live videos of these players are like Arnaud Verrier, another French player who's just insane. But he's an incredible player as well and a wonderful human being. And he has that consistency but he also has that accuracy, that requirement to learn a part for exactly every hit that it's meant to be. And I think he does that more than I do, that I, than I have done for many, many years, that he has to nail the part exactly how it is. Maybe not that he has to, but that he, he aims to hit, uh, play the drum part um, with complete respect to the programmer who poured over the detail of the programming, even though the way it's programmed isn't ergonomically suitable for drums. He takes that mindset further to the idea of hitting not only as hard as the sample, but in the same way, in the same kind of phrasing that makes sense when you're drawing dots, but doesn't make so much sense when you're leading left hand, right hand, foot, foot, wherever it's landing, you know what I mean, mechanically. He's taking the sacrifice to go a step further, much in the same way that Jojo Mayer does in the world of drum and bass, learning how to play drums in like a, you know, in a sequenced kind of way, uh, mimicking the way that sequences uh, make randomness happen when it comes to the way that they make drum loops happen. If you haven't heard of Jojo Mayer, check him out, check out some of his talks and his educational content on that, because it's, especially if you're interested in the whole uh, human versus computer, back and forth that we're having so much of over the last decade. Um, you'll really, really enjoy checking that out because he was doing it before any of us were doing any of this. Like, let me tell you that. Um, well, yeah, he's incredible. Another French drummer who's mad good at all of this is Morgan Botte. Um, he plays for Cadinia and I'm sure he's played for a lot of other incredible musicians. I've seen all sorts of content from him, but I know of his playing in Cadinia and he's incredible because he's got the technicality, the specificness as well of what notes are being hit and the shaping of it in a computerized kind of way, plus the consistency. But he then also incorporates improvisational flair, which I'm a huge fan of because it's one thing to play these things note for note, like hit for hit like this. It's a whole nother thing to then add flair to it, you know, which is something that actually um, Matt Halpin himself helped me with a lot when I, filled in for Periphery in 2013. I was really struggling with, at the time I was all about playing, again, exactly the hits, never improvise, always do it exactly the same every night. And he was the one who was like, hey, you can have a bit of fun with this, you know, you can open it up to be a bit more like that. And um, it was in the rehearsal just before, because I'd only gotten 24 hours notice to fill in for Periphery on this tour. I had to jump in and make it work. I didn't have time to get every voicing down and learning that and then having Matt in the rehearsal room the night before the show where I just pulled an all-nighter and him and Misha and Alex Markidis, their sound guy, came to my place at like two in the morning and I'm like, mate, this part, I can't, I don't know how, I can't get the muscle memory he was in. He was just like, well, break it down to its accents and then fill in the gaps. And then analyzing that more led me on a journey that's led to me where, at a place where I'm at now, where I'm, a lot of the time I'm not hitting the same way twice. I'm letting that kind of improvisational nature take shape. And there's a lot of time and effort and practice that went into developing that on top of that kind of consistency. And this is where that uh, phrase I'm talking about, life imitating art, imitating life is coming from is that you know, it's one thing to sound like the computer, but it's another thing to have human flair, plus consistency, plus smiles, plus groove, plus 
you know, emotion and all that into it. So Morgan, he does that as well. And nothing, no reference uh, negatively intended to the way that Anup or Arno do it. Everyone's got their own flair, their own way, and it's beautiful and magical, and I absolutely love it. But yeah, some other players that in some other worlds, you know, that I've seen that do this kind of thing, like Ali Richardson from Bleed From Within, the consistency on that guy is just unreal. He's so, so, so sick. Um, he is, he plays for Bleed From Within, as I say. And um, he also filled in for Frog Leap on a tour where I was actually contacted to play for Frog Leap for this tour, but it was too soon after my injury, I was sure that I, I'm not sure how to say, was I unsure I could do it? I think it was more like I was sure that I couldn't do it consistently. And that if I did try and do it, for the sake of the fact I couldn't, I didn't want to turn it down because I really wanted to play with Rabia and, and do that project with them for that tour. If I had, um, if I had done that, it would have been an unfair amount of pressure to put on them to know that I might drop out at any second because of, you know, whatever. So, yeah, uh, but I was really, really happy with the way that, to see the way that Ali smashed it. And I knew he would, I, I absolutely knew he would kill it, which is why I recommended him. But yeah, the way he plays is mad. You should definitely check out some of his playing, because again, I'm sure there's been an element of that, like, you know, working towards a level of consistency that hasn't necessarily been in influenced by people really doing it. I'm also interested to know which drummers have started doing this early on without the knowledge of that the fact that they're listening to computers or if it's that they're seeing the actual people who learned to play in a way that computers did when they thought that they weren't real. I'm really interested in all of that. There's also some other players like Josh Miller, who until recently played for Amur, and I uh, learned of him not over the internet, but in person when he played for Glass Cloud on a tour that Monuments did with Glass Cloud back in America. I think it was Scale the Summit, Glass Cloud, co-headlining, and then there was Reflections, Monuments and Error, and I believe it was Monuments and Error that traded opening slots, and Glass Cloud and Scale the Summit that traded. Um, traded headline slots and on that tour um, Glass Cloud had just lost their bassist and drummer so it was just Josh Travis and Jerry Rausch on vocals and so Josh Miller came in as a fill-in drummer the bass was all on track but Josh couldn't get more than about four or five songs down so drummers on that tour were filling in as well there was another drummer called uh, Derek Shapowatch I think I'm pronouncing that right who very sadly passed away I think two or three years ago, and he was an absolutely awesome person and a great player as well, but just such a joyous, joyous, joyous human. And uh, I hoped to have been able to meet him again and again on tours, but sometimes you just don't get that chance. So rest in peace, my dude, he was fucking amazing. Um, but also Alex Ballow from Era, he was smashing it for Glass Cloud for some songs, but Going back to Josh Miller, man, the first time I heard him play, I could hear the consistency and the ghost notes from outside. I was like in the van learning a Glass Cloud song before the first show to just jump in as soon as possible. I didn't do it on the first night because I was just building a metronome and learning what the hell was going on. And then I had to stop because I heard them play and I was like, what the hell? Because yeah, I think we turned up too late for the first show to actually play. Uh, but we but we showed up anyway because we we had massive delays and everything so we showed up to the first show even though we didn't play the first show we were still there and so then you know I, then learning about the drum situation learning a glass cloud song in the band hearing baby j's uh, baby j's his nickname that he went by at the time i'm not sure if he still does but hearing josh's snare consistency and like and just drum power from outside the venue i just had to shut the laptop and go in and watch this guy because i was like dude what the hell is going on again i recognized that and it's amazing when you hear a sound and you're like I think this person's gone through similar things again I don't know how much they've had the same injury issues but uh, I'm again really interested in finding all of that out but yeah what an incredible player really really love him and uh, yeah he plays now in a band called Darko now and um, yeah they're making some really sick stuff if you like a mirror if you like that sound check them out I'm sure you've already heard of them but yeah check that out as well incredible player and also, the drummer from Polyphia himself, Clay Aish... I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Aishleman? I'm gonna go with that. Um, he's got an incredible sound going on because not only he's nailing the consistency of 
the metal drums, the technicality of the programming in a way that sounds very much like he's nailing the parts exactly every time. If he is improvising, it's in a really cool way where you're not quite aware of it as it happens. But he's also nailing that kind of sequenced sound that Giorgio Meyer does uh, in the way that he's emulating how computers are playing the electronic drum parts in loops. But unlike Giorgio Meyer, that he's emulating like the more modern uh, hip hop trap kind of style hi hats and stuff, which is obviously the level of computing difference between like computerless uh, standalone um, low memory sequences that Giorgio Meyer was emulating. The kind of software and computing power that the programs or plugins that the trap hi-hats are then using the way they jump between subdivisions. It's so much more complex and when he plays this stuff it sounds like is that human or is that you know you know which parts are play being played and which parts aren't to the point where I thought that the hi-hats and stuff like that on those tracks um, on tracks like GOAT and stuff all that like really cool percussiveness and uh, you know kind of metric bending um, syncopations and subdivision going from triplets in and out and like you know jumping up and down and whatever you know kind of sound is going on when I then what I you know I was sure that like okay cool sort of hi-hat percussiveness is all the program stuff and then he just comes in for the metal bits then I saw a playthrough of his and I was like no he's playing along to all of it okay yes he might be doing one part which has like an interplay between the real percussiveness plus the computerized stuff. I wonder what the interplay is there. Is he question and answering off of all of that? Those hi-hats, is he just doing a set part and knowing that the other part fills in the gaps? I'm really interested in all of that because I, you know, have studied in a way how to fill in the gaps between tracks when I did stuff with Disperse and with Algorithm. I would try and work with the, you know, work with the digital drums wherever possible in a way to maximize the live impact of a part not necessarily to make me play everything but to play the part that looks or sounds the coolest live let the computer do the rest or actually using samples on an SBDSX pad like I would do so I've got so much respect for him and for what he was doing with that like big time it's it's so so sick I just really again want to thank everyone in that chat Tosin, Misha and Tim and Rick thank you so much for the for the awareness that you've passed on to my kind of journey and all of these other drummers' journeys. Um, the fact that you're the ones who actually pointed this out when you're also the ones, especially Misha, who inspired this entire sound and this entire movement that's completely changed the way that drummers in even all kinds of metal genres have uh, had to learn how to play. Um, you know, basically changing the entire school of thought. It's just amazing to see that kind of reception. Um, it's really heartwarming and I'm very, very grateful. And I please implore you to check out all of their channels, especially Rick's as well. What an incredible round table that was. That kind of musical conversation is just invaluable to the inspired up and coming musician who with a wealth of YouTube at their fingertips to learn all about all of that. Definitely please subscribe to them all, check out their regular content as and when it comes out, it, they'll appreciate it so much and it helps them to do what they do, which is furthering uh, the progression of our wonderful creative outputs with this kind of music. I don't want to get too mushy with it, but it, it's really meaningful and I just, that's why I wanted to make this video, I just really wanted to continue that conversation and if any of the drummers resonate with this, please talk about it in the comments, let's get a conversation going. Any of my peers, any other drummers who have gone through this and uh, do this on a regular basis, let's chat, let's talk, you know, maybe I'll hit up some of these guys to do some live streams and you know, then turn them into YouTube videos afterwards. If you wanna see some of that stuff, please check out my Twitch and my Discord. I do a lot more personalized chats about what kind of stuff I'm gonna be doing on my Discord and Twitch is where a lot of my YouTube content happens live as well at the moment. So definitely check that out if you can. And I also wanna ask you, the viewer, this, if you're a drummer or a musician who's been inspired by technology or even further, someone who's seen the bar being raised on YouTube and it's affected your maybe 
not just the way you approach your passion or your output, but enhanced it and maybe enriched your life as a result. I'd love to hear more examples of that because I find it so interesting and I'd love to hear from you. So please do pop that in the comments and let's have a chat about all of this. Let's keep this wonderful energy going because I think it's such an important chat to be having and especially around about, you know, 10 to 15 years since the, in my mind, pioneers were doing things like this as well. The writers like Akulkani, John Brown, who I then ended up working with and, you know, getting to do that with, um, Paul Ortiz of Chimpspanner, who's also the producer of Daniel Tompkins from Tesseract's uh, solo material, who I'm going to be working with live as well. Keep an eye out for stuff with Dan Tompkins' solo project. Uh, we're going to do some shows. I'm going to put some videos out. It's going to be super, super sick. So keep an eye on that. If it's already out, you'll be seeing links to it around here now. If you'd be willing to hit subscribe on my channel, I'd really, really appreciate it. At this point, I'm at this many subscribers and I would so love to take that up. Right now, I'm looking to hit 10K as an initial goal. So please do hit that subscribe button if you found any of this inspirational or educational. I really appreciate it. And hopefully I will see you either in a live stream soon or in the comment section in one of my next videos. Either way, have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time. Cheers.